Damn it. Ow. Ow. <laughs> I tripped on my ghost cheat. <laughs> well, this is going to be a terrible episode. Season's greetings, nitwits, and welcome to Knitting Time with Willie. My name is Willie Muse, joined as always by my co-host, Nicholas. And as you can tell from that flawlessly executed scare that I just pulled off, today is my Halloween episode. I, I know I said that last video was going to be my Halloween episode, but like, people change, get over it. Stop living in the past. Why don't you go watch my last video if you love it so much? Actually, seriously, do go watch my last video, it, it didn't do that great, and I can use all the views that I can get. Anywho, since I love Halloween like the basic white lady that I am, I wanted to do something really special for this one. So I gave a lot of thought about what the ideal Halloween episode of my show would look like, and since one of the things I do on here a lot is talk about bad movies, I figured finding a so bad it's good Halloween movie would be the perfect video for me to make in order to best honor the spirit of the season. It's probably not very surprising to anyone watching this, but I actually love just about any movie that's even mildly related to the horror genre, and since bad horror is practically a genre unto itself, I figured that thinking of a good, bad, scary movie to talk about would be a pretty easy thing to do. Unfortunately, I was quite wrong. As I scrolled through all of my perennial favorites in my mind, I couldn't think of anything that I thought would make for a good video. All of the other so bad they're good horror movies I could think about, like, like Sleepaway Camp or, or Nick Cage's Wicker Man, had already been talked about ad nauseum by other, lesser channels, and so I didn't want to do those. Also, let's be honest, there's no way in hell that I'm going to be touching Sleepaway Camp with a 10-foot pole. All of the other movies I could think of were just things that I genuinely loved, and so rather than spending a couple of weeks writing subpar jokes about them for the purposes of a YouTube video, more than anything, I just wanted to watch them. One movie in particular got me thinking, like, wow, I need to watch that movie before the month of October is up, and that's because I watch it every year around this time, and that's because it is my absolute favorite movie ever made in history. It is called Ernest Scared Stupid, and I believe it to be the single scariest kids movie ever made. It is also one of the funniest movies ever made, and just a beautiful all-around piece of filmmaking. So the moment I realized that the time had come where I could have my annual viewing, I knew I needed to make it happen immediately, and so I did just that. Later that night, I got drunk at my friend's birthday party, stole his remote to sign in to my Amazon account because it's not streaming anywhere and obviously I own it, and then I made a room full of adult people watch Ernest Scared Stupid with me. When the movie was over and I had finally finished clapping, I talked to the rest of the party to see how much they loved it on a scale from great to perfect. and. Based on the murderous looks in their eyes, is I started to realize that maybe they weren't as happy to have just watched that cinematic masterpiece as I was. According to them, my favorite movie of all time was not very good, and after I had flipped over my friend's coffee table and stormed out of their apartment, I had a bit of an idea. Maybe looking at my all-time favorite movie through the lens of it being bad, could make for a really interesting video, you know? After all, you know what they say, kill your darlings. So now, despite all logic, I will be discussing Ernest Scared Stupid as though we were living in some weird alternate universe where it is considered a bad movie. And just as with all both of my other bad movie videos, I'll let you guys know if it was bad if it was fun, and if I learned a lesson along the way, which 
I can't imagine that I won't because this movie is bold and it contains multitudes. So rather than prattling on, why don't I go watch the movie so we can get this discussion going? I, I know I said that I already watched it recently, but since I started talking about it, it's, it's made me want to watch it again, so... Whatever, don't judge me. I'll be back. All right, it's still perfect. Let's do this thing. Ernest Scared Stupid is one of many films in the Ernest series, which follows Ernest P. Worrell, who is a character that's kind of like a redneck version of Pee Wee Herman. I don't, I don't know if I'm allowed to say redneck, so on the off chance that it's offensive, just know that that's the movie's term, not mine. They call Ernest a redneck a lot. Ernest is played by an actor named Jim Varney, who is absolutely awesome and who you probably recognize even if you've never seen an Ernest film. And that's because he's the voice of the slinky dog in the Toy Story movies. It's, it's unfortunate to me that so many people know him from, from such a lesser role, but that said, I guess not every film he was going to do would have been as good as Scared Stupid, so... I don't know, he had to make money somehow. Over the course of the series, Ernest uh, goes to jail. He goes to camp, I think. Uh, he might have gone to Africa at one point. I hope I'm remembering that wrong because there's no way that that aged well, but I'm pretty sure that's one of the movies. He, he saves Christmas, probably. I'm not positive, but that seems like something he'd do, so maybe. I don't know. Ernest does a lot of things, but I couldn't tell you for sure what any of them are because I've never seen a single film of his outside of the one we're about to talk about today, and I really do not intend on changing that anytime soon. And hearing that, a lot of you right now might be thinking something along the lines of, Willie, how is that possible? I thought you said that this was your favorite movie. That's madness. Madness, I say. And to you, I say two things. One, chill out. That is a very extreme reaction you just had. And two, yeah, exactly. Scared Stupid was the first Ernest movie I ever saw. And as far as I was concerned, they got it in one. I had no need for other Ernest films because I already had the perfect one right in front of me. Like, like there's no situation I could think of where I would be in the mood to watch an Ernest movie and not just want to watch Scared Stupid again. And watch it again, I did. I bet if you were to ask my mother what her least favorite movie of all time was, she would probably say it's this one because she had to watch it about 8,000 times over the course of my childhood. We, we didn't own it because I don't think my mom would do that to herself, but if we were ever in a situation where we were going to rent a film, Odds were better than not that I was going straight for Scared Stupid. I think what drew me to it is that it was kind of like a gateway horror movie. Like I said, I love all things scary and spooky and all that jazz, but I don't think I officially got into that stuff until I was in high school because for a long time I was just too much of a scaredy cat goody two-shoes to bring myself to watch any of it. Ernest Scared Stupid had just enough silly humor and bright colors that I felt okay watching it, even though I was an easily frightened wimp. It was kind of like the training bra version of a horror movie, you know, like not quite the real thing, but just enough to get you used to it. I'm not entirely sure why I used training bra as the comparison there. There's probably a much better analogy that's not nearly as creepy, but... Well, frankly, I'm too lazy to think about it now, so what's done is done.
And none of that is to imply that this movie isn't scary because that is not the case. In fact, I would argue that it's a lot scarier than a lot of the horror movies I was too scared to watch. I just didn't realize it because it was marketed as a comedy first and foremost. But no, man, this shit is absolutely fucked up. Like, like I'm not even being hyperbolic when I say that there are certain scenes in this movie that scarred me emotionally and greatly contributed to turning me into the anxiety-ridden wreck of a human person that you see before you today. There's one scene in particular that I'm pretty sure is the reason I'm an insomniac now, and if you've seen this movie before, I'm pretty sure you know which scene I'm talking about. If you haven't seen this before, then why don't I start breaking down the plot in more detail so you can know exactly what scene I'm talking about, because... Well, if I have to be emotionally scarred by it, then you, you should too. If you've seen the movie Hocus Pocus, then you already know the basic plot of Ernest Scared Stupid. You know, children awaken an ancient evil on Halloween and need to figure out how to stop it before the night is up and they become too powerful and do bad stuff. Take over the world, I guess. I assume that the implication of Hocus Pocus is that if the kids don't stop them in time, the witches will eventually take over the world, and now that I'm saying that out loud, if that is the case, then I would very much want a sequel that's, that's just like a war movie, but it's about the entire world's militaries fighting three witches as they go on like a bloody onslaught in their quest for world domination. That sounds pretty awesome. I, I would definitely watch that film. In any case, the plot of this movie is basically the same as the plot of Hocus Pocus, only instead of witches, it's gross looking trolls. And also there's a dumb southern man in the center of everything. And before all you Hocus Pocus heads out there go and start calling shenanigans, just know that Ernest Scared Stupid came out two years earlier, so if anyone is ripping anyone off, it's Hocus Pocus. Which is not to say anything negative of Hocus Pocus, because I would never, that's probably my second favorite movie. If anything, I firmly believe that more movies should use this exact format, because truly the only thing I ever want to see from a movie is just like, nice shots of fall in a small town, a little bit of magic, and then children being put in a bunch of dangerous situations that are bound to scar them emotionally for the rest of their lives. But that said, I do still feel the need to point out that Ernest Scared Stupid came first because in case it wasn't clear, I love it very much and I want to make sure it gets its due. But anyways, like Hocus Pocus, Ernest Scared Stupid begins in Puritan times where a mob of angry pilgrims has just subdued the film's central antagonist. Well, actually, technically, it begins with an awesome montage of Ernest making silly faces while public domain horror movies play, but that doesn't really have much to do with the plot, so we should probably start with the Angry Pilgrim mob. From the get-go, this movie seems to actively be trying to make children empty their bowels from fear, as evidenced by this opening shot of a little girl being chased by this film's answer to the Sanderson sisters, Trantor the Troll. And like, keep in mind that that unpleasant long take of a child crying is the opening of a children's movie. I, I cannot stress that enough. Although, thankfully, before we're treated to a bloody shot of her being mauled to death by a troll, she's saved by a bunch of villagers with a net. And don't get me wrong, I'm happy that little girl is safe, but I also feel like the introduction of the people with the nets makes this scene infinitely more disturbing because they make you realize that that little girl is being used as human bait right now, which like, 
I don't know, being chased by a murderous troll is one thing, but having the adults meant to care for you willingly put you in such a dangerous situation is a whole other can of worms. You can tell how little they care for that girl's well-being by the fact that they catch her in the net with the troll, which like, pro probably not a very pleasant moment for her. Tro troll or not, she's clearly not living her best life. That little girl's inevitable PTSD notwithstanding, the troll is captured and taken care of in the only logical way, by being buried alive by a mob of angry, torch-wielding townsfolk. They, they also plant a sapling over the gravesite, I presume because they already have their shovels out and they're doing their best to improve their carbon footprint. That was a really dumb joke. I'm sorry. And here he shall be buried, and this oak tree will seal his fate. Its roots will be his prison, which must never be disturbed. That stern-looking preacher is actually being played by Jim Ernest Varney himself, who in a tremendous show of acting skill is nearly unrecognizable while playing his own great-great-great-great-grandfather because, well, he's awesome. Like, like I'm 100% serious when I say that I believe him to be one of the greatest actors to have ever lived. Fuck off, Marlon Brando. Before they can bury him alive for decades and condemn him to a fate worse than any of us could possibly imagine in our worst nightmares, Trantor the Troll makes a prophecy about how he will one day be freed from his prison. Bear me, hideous horror. When the face of death covers the moon, one with your blood in his veins will release me. And victory will at last be mine! Basically, one of the preacher's descendants will disturb his resting place on the night before Halloween and awaken Trantor from his slumber, and I bet you guys can't guess which one of those descendants it will be. I'll give you a clue. He's about to be scared stupid. Like Hocus Pocus, it's then revealed that that entire open scene was actually just a story being told in a classroom, and Everything we just saw is actually just the report of a little girl who I can only describe as Carol Kane's mini-me. The people of Briarville bury Trancher the Troll in the cold, damp ground. The end. Thank you, Elizabeth. Class, what did you think of her report? That's bull! It's not bull! I read it in a book. Little Carol Kane then explains that along with his prophecy, Trantor also lays a curse on the preacher's family, condemning them to get stupider and stupider with each passing generation, which is honestly just a brilliant little piece of screenwriting because though it is just a single line, it actually explains every aspect of Ernest's character, like, like he is stupid. Th that is his entire character description. And we know that now. Then to make sure we understand just how stupid Ernest is, we're treated to a fun little scene of him almost being crushed to death by a trash compactor. No, no, don't stick my head in those gears. It's me or you. And I have a family at the doll factory. I'll send him a nice card. You'll never get away with this, Ernest. I know where you live. That scene is a really good example of a thing that happens a lot in this movie, which is that they try to add levity to an otherwise dark situation by throwing in some comedy, but they end up making it way worse because the comedy in question kind of just reads as Ernest being severely mentally ill. Like at one point he's referred to as a multiple personality because... But well, he seems to have multiple personalities, and while I think it's probably safe to say that he's not a textbook accurate portrayal of DID necessarily, I definitely do think it's fair to say that he seems to not be fully in touch with reality in a way that's more than a little concerning. Even when he's not completely dissociating, there's always something a little bit off about Ernest. Like, there are a lot of times when he'll be like cracking jokes during moments of extreme peril, and Though that's definitely part of the character's charm, it also makes me want to be like, do you not see? 
the giant scary troll that's trying to steal your soul right now? Or what's going on here, buddy? Now, right now, a lot of you are probably heading to the comments to say something along the lines of, It's just a children's character, Willie. You're overthinking it. And to you, I say, yes, of course I am. This is YouTube. That's what we do here. Like, do you also go to WWE matches and scream fake at the ring? Because it's basically the same thing. Also, I'm making an hour-long video about Ernest Scared Stupid. Do you really think I care what you think? The reason that Ernest found himself in that trash compactor is because he is the local garbage man for a small southern town. And as you can guess by the fact that he almost died on the job, he's not a very good one. As we learn in the following scene, he's been neglecting his job a little bit. Sheriff. I've just come from the Hackmore place. It's an absolute mess. It violates every code on the book. I want it cleaned up, and I want it cleaned up immediately. So, well, Mayor, I served the papers, and Ernest said he would get right on it. If he can't handle it, he's firing. And, like, granted, I don't know much about how small-town government works, but I'm fairly certain that the chain of command there isn't mayor, sheriff, garbage man. Like, like maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think that there's any place in America where the sheriff has authority to fire a garbage man because, like, I'm, pr I'm pretty sure they're completely different departments. Still, maybe this town is something of a police state, and since Ernest doesn't want to lose his job, he does as the sheriff says and goes to the house of old lady Hackmore to clean the garbage off of her lawn, a chore he's been putting off because Ernest seems to be afraid of the old woman because... Uh oh, she's genuinely a little bit scary. Well, nobody home. I guess they're out robbing graves or biting the heads off chickens or whatever's in Voodoo Vogue. Get off of my property! What are you doing here? She's played by Eartha Kitt, who if you don't know who that is, then how dare you? How the fuck dare you? I think that like Jim Varney, most of you will probably know her from a voice acting role she had in a Disney movie because she played Yzma in The Emperor's New Groove, but if that is all you know her from, then go look her up immediately because she's a badass and she deserves all of your respect. Her character here is depicted as a crazy lady at the edge of town and like, like I'm not entirely sure if she's supposed to be a witch, but, but she might be. If she is a witch, she is a very grounded portrayal of a witch in a way that I feel like, 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 like if there was like a real world council of witches out there who graded movies on how accurately their witch characters represented the realities of what it was like to be a witch, I feel like this movie would get a surprisingly high grade, if that makes sense. She doesn't really have powers or anything like that. She's just an eccentric woman with a lot of knowledge of the occult and some spell books and stuff in a way that feels weirdly grounded for a movie like this. Although, that said, based on the timeline of the movie, there's also a solid chance that she's immortal. So like, who knows? Whether she's a witch or not though, one thing is for sure, and that is that she definitely has a flamethrower. I don't know why exactly she has that, but it's awesome and I love her very much. Ernest is at her house because the town is making her clean her lawn, which honestly feels like another hint that this town may be a bit of a police state because the garbage on her lawn feels less like garbage and more like artwork. Like, like I think we're meant to think that her house looks like a trash dump, but really to me, it just kind of looks like the most popular section of Burning Man. Feels to me like she should be allowed to keep her stuff, particularly since there's clearly no other houses around for miles, so I don't know who's complaining about her lawn to the police, but they sound like they're an asshole. Honestly, I feel like the bigger issue here is the fact that she just has random fires burning on her porch, because, like, I don't know, that feels like it could be a little bit of a hazard, given that she lives in the middle of a forest. 
Because of her witch knowledge, Mrs. Hackmore freaks out when she realizes who Ernest is because she knows that he's destined to awaken an ancient evil, and so she coolly and calmly asks Ernest to leave. Ma'am, I'm an official representative of the Briarville City Government, and incidentally a close personal friend of Mayor Murdoch's. Aren't you that Warrill kid? Yes, ma'am. <gasps> oh! You will bring down the curse on us all. Woe to you, oh, you see the Worrell. Get out of here and don't come back. And like, I got to imagine that at the time, legendary actress Eartha Kitt probably wasn't super pumped to be doing Ernest Scared Stupid, but it's clear from that reaction that she is giving this role her all. And that honestly just makes me respect her even more than I already did. She's awesome. To make sure that Ernest leaves her property, she then uses the aforementioned flamethrower. <laughs> and I know that I already showed you that clip, but like, I love it, so I wanted to show it again. While Ernest is narrowly escaping a horrible fiery death, on the other side of town, our three young protagonists are getting ready for Halloween. And as with all other movies I cover, I refuse to learn the characters' names unless absolutely necessary, but it's a main kid with a bowl cut, the Carol Kane girl from earlier, and a kid with glasses who looks like he'd be really mean to me at a gay bar. The kids are setting up a haunted house, and, and like I know that they're children, and I don't want to be mean, but it's terrible, and they should be ashamed of themselves for it. They'll come in here and go through that door and up this way where Joey hits him in the face with a mop. A wet mop. Then they'll have to crawl through all these peeled grapes while I'm screaming. Where are my eyes? Don't step on my eyeballs. Gross. But I love it. Thankfully, that piece of shit doesn't last long though because the two town bullies who also happen to be the sons of the town mayor because there are only four families in this town come and destroy it. And though the movie paints this as a cruel act, I actually think the bullies are heroes and the kids should be grateful for ridding the world of their god-awful haunted house. The kids don't seem to see it that way though, and so Bullcut goes to Ernest to ask for his advice on what he should do next because, well, Ernest seems to be an integral part of this friend group. Like, like he's kind of like the fourth musketeer of this group of 10 year olds. And right now, some of you may be thinking that he's just some weirdo who's only friends with young children, but that's not true. This is a 90s movie, so he's also friends with a weirdly smart Jack Russell Terrier. He's a lot like other adorable dog sidekicks of the time period, only he's better because his name is Rimshot, which sounds like rim job, so I always giggle when I hear it. When he hears about Bullcut's problems, Ernest tells him that they need to build a treehouse that's high enough that the bullies can't get to it. And so like the friend that he is, he takes the young children into the woods in order to help them find a proper tree to build it on. And well, I bet you can't guess which tree they pick. I'll give you a hint. It's about to scare Ernest stupid. The fort they build is the kind of badass domicile that makes me hope that I too might one day be a homeowner and it does serve its purpose because when the bullies come to try and fuck with the kids again, they get their asses handed to them. The kids attack from the high ground using extremely badass 90s kids weaponry like a dog food cannon and a pizza launcher and while their arsenal is undoubtedly cooler than anything that actually exists in the real world, it also feels a bit unnecessary to me, like, like, like I feel like if I were those kids I'd probably just whip a bunch of rocks at the bullies because it's a lot cheaper and it would probably hurt them a lot more. Although that said, I guess they do heat the pizza up before they launch it, so maybe they're just a little more sadistic than I am and they're trying to scald the bullies, which like, I respect it. There are no rules in love and war. Whatever the case, I do think it's extremely impressive that they seem to have created these weapons in the span of a couple of hours while simultaneously building a full treehouse from scratch. I, I don't know why they didn't apply that same engineering prowess to their piss poor excuse for a haunted house, but I guess that that's a question for another day.
Old Lady Hackmore finds out that the guy destined to unleash an ancient evil built a house on top of the tree that's planted on said ancient evil, and when she does, she is pissed. A whole world of trees, and you had to pick this one. Well, we didn't know this was your land, or we would have asked if it was okay. You will open the ancient door, and all that looks inside. <gasps> Flee this evil place! Flee! And like, I know you can't really force these things, but I do genuinely think that that little part should become a popular meme format, because... It has a million different uses. <gasps> Flee this evil place! Flee! <gasps> Flee this evil place! Flee! <gasps> Flee this evil place! Flee! Look, I never said I was good at making memes, okay? Shut up. Ernest goes to talk to her, and she seemingly tells him every single detail of the curse, which Ernest in turn comes back and tells the kids, and in doing so, he ends up accidentally freeing Trantor. He can only be awakened on the night before Halloween. Like tonight. When a world Like you. Places his hand on a tree, like this, and says, Yea, I call thee forth, Trantor. But what are the chances of that happening? And the movie treats this like Ernest is being a huge dummy, which I guess he is, but that's also to be expected. But that said, I feel like the real dummy in this situation is actually Mrs. Hackmore, because it really feels like she's the only reason that Ernest is able to do what he did. There is no way in hell Ernest would have guessed that exact combination of words on his own, so I feel like had she just not said anything to him, he probably would have just chilled with his 10-year-old friends in their treehouse, and that would have been the end of it. Instead, it seems like she sat him down and gave him a beat-by-beat -beat breakdown of what not to do, and then was just like, and now that you know exactly what to say, Please don't say it, and I feel like that's actually a pretty stupid way to go about that. D don't tell her I said that, obviously, because I don't want to be on her bad side, but I feel like she, she has blood on her hands. What's done is done, though, and so Trantor the Troll has been freed, and this is where the movie becomes, as the French would say, pants-shittingly terrifying. A large chunk of the rest of the movie is just watching him steal the souls of frightened children and turn them into little wooden dolls, and the first victim of his that we see is the kid with glasses, because uh, of course he is. He has glasses. The children split up at the end of the night and walk home alone through the woods because it was the 90s. and. We should all be dead by now, and on his way home, he accidentally falls into a ditch, which, unfortunately for Glass's kid, is only the start of his woes. Ah! Somebody help me! Help! Anyone! Oh! Help! Somebody! Ernest! Help! Oh! Oh! Kitty! Elizabeth! Where are you? Oh! Oh! Help! Come on! Hey, I gotcha. Thanks, Ernest. You saved me. I thought it was a goner. <laughs> As you can clearly see, that is some intense bullshit for a children's movie. Like, for starters, Glass's kid was screwed one way or the other, because even if the troll hadn't showed up, he would still be stuck in a ditch for god knows how long, so one way or the other, he's coming out of those woods scarred for life. Unfortunately for him though, he meets a fate even worse than starving to death in a ditch, and so we're treated to the sight of him being painfully transformed into a wooden statue of himself screaming as the troll steals his soul, which is a depressing thing to watch happen to a child, and would have been even more unpleasant if the child in question didn't have glasses. On top of that, this is the first good glimpse we get of the troll, and as you can clearly see, he is the scariest creature who has ever existed. Like, 
Like, I feel like if I told you that the villain of this movie was a troll with two noses, you'd be like, that sounds silly, but no, he is not silly in the least. He is nightmare fuel, and all of our mental health is now worse for having seen his face. Then, to make things even worse, he uses magic to copy Ernest's voice, so we're tricked into thinking we're going to see some lovable goofball that the movie has taught us to trust, only to be blindsided by the worst face this side of Ted Cruz. It's a really intense thing to put in a kid's movie because it basically teaches you that you can't trust anyone. And well, I carry that lesson with me to this day. And you'd think that the movie couldn't possibly get any more disturbing than that clip because, well, nothing should be more disturbing than that clip. But honestly, the most upsetting part of the movie comes when Trantor decides to steal little Carol Kane's soul. And I'm not even joking in any way when I say that I genuinely believe that the scene I'm about to show you might truly be one of the scariest moments in the history of cinema. It all starts with baby Carol Kane sitting on her bed, looking noticeably upset. When her mom comes in, she sees that something is wrong with her daughter, and so she does what all good mothers would do. She, she, she tells her child that their feelings are stupid. That little doll looked just like Joey, and Ernest said- Honey, we have been through all this. There are no such things as trolls. Uh, Mom, while you're in here, could you check under the bed? I thought I heard- Stop acting like you're two years old. There is nothing under the bed. Now put on your costume and come on downstairs. We're all going over to the Halloween party together. But mom... Elizabeth, don't be silly. And that may not seem that bad on its own because like, I guess I would also probably not take it that seriously if my kid was deathly afraid of a troll attack. But what you need to keep in mind there is that it's been established that her friend Glasses Kid never came home the night before. So even if the mother doesn't believe in trolls, she should still recognize that maybe the daughter has a reason to be shaken, what with the, the disappearance of her friend and everything. What's more is that the little girl mentioned seeing the wooden doll that Glasses Kid transformed into, which would be a pretty concerning thing to hear from your child, even if you are coming from the perspective that a troll didn't do it. Like, from the mother's point of view, either the daughter actually did see a wooden doll of a missing child, which would point to some sort of like Boo Radley-esque serial killer who with a whittling habit who's been stalking local children, or she didn't see the doll, but she's just so torn up over the fact that her friend is missing that she thinks she did. And in either case, it feels like maybe giving the little girl some like reassurance by checking under her bed wouldn't be the worst thing in the world for a mother to do right now. Instead, this happens. There's nothing under the bed. There's nothing under the bed. There's nothing under the bed. hundred percent serious when I say that for the vast majority of my life I had to sleep with my bed against a wall as a direct result of this scene because I needed to make sure that there was no possible way that anyone or anything else could possibly be behind me. The scene basically put the idea in my head that I have to be on alert at all times even in the comfort of my bed and that idea really fucked with my ability to sleep because when you're always on the lookout for danger that makes you not really want to close your eyes at the end of the night. It's definitely not as bad as it used to be, but I do think that I still carry this scene with me to this day. Like, I'm not really scared of the troll so much anymore, but I do think that I still feel the need a lot of the time to try and be aware of everything that might be coming for me from every possible angle, and I think that this scene was the seed that planted that idea in my brain. 
Don't get me wrong, it's definitely not the only reason I'm screwed up, but the scene definitely had ripple effects that went far beyond just how I sleep, and it probably played a pretty big part in shaping me into the anxious mess of a human person that you see before you today. I, f I feel like I just had like a breakthrough in therapy somehow, which like... Could you imagine how lame it would be if all of my problems were the direct result of Ernest Scared Stupid? I guess I wouldn't put it past me though. I hate my life. In any case, while Trantor is gallivanting around town having the time of his life murdering children, Ernest is doing his best to try and put his reign of terror to an end. After encountering the troll for himself, he goes to Old Lady Hackmore for advice, and she tells him through poetry that it's his responsibility to stop the troll. From the innocence of five, an evil army shall arise. When blossoms shower down like rain, my dark kingdom will come again. There is one who can stop me if he will dare the heart of a child and a mother's care. Are there any more pictures? You've got to stop him before he gets the children. He's got to get five before midnight tomorrow night. Me? Stop that thing? You got the wrong guy. You are the direct descendant of the Reverend Phineas Worrell. It's your legacy. And so Ernest goes about setting traps all around town, which is exactly as bad of an idea as it sounds. Okay, Rimshot. Now bring me the stick. The stick, boy. Bring me the stick. Please, Rimshot. I, I was just kidding about that ugly thing, honest. Rimshot. Oh. Ah! I don't know who thought it was okay to sell Ernest a bear trap, but I feel like there really should have been like a background check or something. Sorry to get political. Ernest's troll hunting adventures reach a low point when he catches something in one of his traps, and he goes to show the sheriff and the mayor what he caught. Ernest, open it up. You want me to squash him flat, Sheriff? Just open the damn thing, Ernest. Slowly, slowly. As you can clearly see there, Ernest captured two children and came this close to crushing them to death, and so naturally this doesn't go over very well, particularly because those crying children are also the mayor's sons. It's not like anyone really believed Ernest about there being a troll running around town, but now they're really not on his side, and so they tell him in no uncertain terms that he needs to stop his hunt, which like... I guess it makes sense, you know, he did almost murder two children. Unfortunately, Ernest loses the town's trust at the worst possible time because on his way home he has another encounter with Trantor, who attacks Ernest's truck this time, and it is here that we learn that Trantor also has a sword. That's right. Just when you didn't think he could possibly get any scarier, now he can cut through metal. There is nowhere you can hide, children. Ernest narrowly escapes Trantor, but as a result of their battle, he somehow ends up trapped in a giant metal tube for some reason, so he hops to Old Lady Hackmore's house for help, and she gets to work on freeing him by using a comically oversized can opener, because this movie is perfect. While there, he takes a look at the book from earlier again, and finds that there are actually two pages stuck together, so he pulls them apart to reveal a page which tells you how to kill the trolls, which feels like a huge mistake on their part that they missed that earlier. feels like if they had read the magic book a little closely the first time, they probably could have saved a few lives. How the- looks like thou canst destroyeth a troll. Thou canst destroyeth a troll with 
uh, M I something K. And I've avoided showing too many of this movie's comedic moments because I don't want to do that thing that people do on here sometimes where they make fun of something that's intentionally funny and then they act like they're the ones making the joke because I hate when that happens and people who do it are stupid. But that said, I don't think that I can properly discuss this movie without talking about Miak. Just as I think this movie has one of the scariest moments in the history of cinema, I also think it contains one of the greatest jokes ever written, and that's what happens here in this scene. And like, I know you're not supposed to think about jokes too much or you ruin them, but that said, I am the exact sort of insufferable comedy nerd who loves doing just that to the point that I've robbed myself of a lot of joy in my life, so why don't I just show you the rest of that scene and then I'll spend too much time explaining why it's goddamn brilliant. How the- looks like thou canst destroyeth a troll. Thou canst destroyeth a troll with- uh, M I something K. We can destroy a troll with M I The pods have not yet dropped. Medic? Medic? The still seeks another yeah, child. That's it. Authentic children? Bulgarian Miak. Well, We've got to go. Okay, so we can start with a simple reason that the joke is funny, and like a lot of jokes in this movie, it's because Ernest is stupid. Very clearly the word is supposed to be milk, and th the fact that Ernest doesn't immediately get that is is very fun and silly. That said, if it had stopped right there, that wouldn't be all that great of a joke, but it keeps going and has Ernest get even stupider by making a guess that is so wildly wrong that it pushes his idiocy into cartoonish new heights that are somehow beyond anything we've seen in the movie before, despite, you know, the fact that, like I've already said, Ernest's entire character is that he's dumb. Then on top of that, the guess he makes would have been funny even if it wasn't insanely stupid. Miak is just a funny word, you know? It sounds silly, it's got the hard K, basically everything is going for it. To this day, I still laugh every time I hear it. Miak. <laughs> it's funny. Finally, to tie it all together, he is incredibly confident in his stupid guess in a way that's almost perplexing. He does not question for a second that his terrible guess is right and that Miak is what's going to rid the world of trolls. And not only that, but he seems intimately familiar with whatever Miak is to the point that he knows that it comes from Bulgaria right off the top of his head. He, he, he almost treats it like it was so obvious that he should have thought of Miak before, despite the fact that it kind of seems like he's the only person in this world who has any idea what Miak is. Also, not for nothing, but a lot of this joke happens kind of in the background of the scene, which, while I don't know if that makes it funnier, it definitely adds a level of subtlety to this stupid joke in a kid's movie that I really, really respect as a writer. And if that was the end of it, it would still probably be one of my favorite jokes in the movie, but as we'll soon learn, it was all just set up to an even better moment. So let's keep talking about the plot so we can get there. Mrs. Hackmore and Ernest decide to put their new knowledge to the test, so they go to the town-wide dance that exists in every Halloween movie for some reason in an effort to try and kill the troll. Ernest goes inside to try and find Trantor before he kills again, and while he does that, Mrs. Hackmore stays in the car and watches this riveting one-act play that occurs in the parking lot. Look, you wanted to be in the costume competition, and this is the costume you picked out at the store. This thing looks silly, and I'm not going to wear it. Don't you talk back to me. Now you march right in there. I hate you. Well, I'm not too fond of you either. Mommy, I'm sorry. I love you. I love you too. <laughs> Unconditional love. That's the heart of a child. And like, I assume it's just because they had to fit that part into a short amount of time, but these characters go through a lot of emotional peaks and valleys in the span of just a few seconds to the point that it almost feels like there's a Hemingway-esque story just below the surface that's being told here. Like, 
Like, I want to know more about these characters and why the mother is driven to tears of joy after her daughter apologizes for saying, I hate you, mommy. Also, not for nothing, but their costumes do suck. I'd be pissed too if I was that little girl. Hate her mommy. Seeing that fight makes Mrs. Hackmore understand the meaning behind the poem from earlier. The mother's care is the milk and the heart of a child is unconditional love. And now she knows that some combination of those two is what's going to bring down Trantor. So she steals a bike and pedals into the film's final act. While Mrs. Hackmore is having the time of her life riding a bicycle, Trantor is inside the dance hall having just taken another victim, and so Ernest shows up to try and take him down. Oh, come on, traitor face. I'm ready for you. Let's see how you like a little meak. Meak? Yeah, meak. I bet you thought I couldn't find any this time of year. Well, I'm a little too resourceful for you. A little too light on my feet. So come on, eat me, I can die too. <laughs> Y'all, he actually finds Miak. Somewhere between Mrs. Hackmore's house and the school, Ernest is able to procure Miak, and then he holds it up to the troll who reacts with pure confusion. It is so good. Nothing I ever write will ever be funnier than that, and I am totally okay with it. Unfortunately, the MEAC doesn't work, and so Trantor trounces Ernest, and in the process ends up stealing Rimshot the dog's soul and turning him into a wooden statue. I won't show you how that actually plays out because it's heartbreaking and I don't want to ruin your day, but just know that it is the saddest thing that has ever happened in the history of Earth, and this movie is an emotional roller coaster. From there, shit pretty much just hits the fan. With the kid that he killed at the dance, Trantor now has enough souls to bring his plan to fruition, and that plan basically just entails him creating more gross trolls to wreak havoc on the world. At the same time, Bullcut Kid has also figured out that the trolls are weak to milk, and so he and the rest of the town kids have showed up to the haunted tree with a bunch of dairy-filled super soakers in order to put an end to the monsters. Most of the rest of the movie is just watching gross, slimy creatures get sprayed in the face with dairy products, which is... Sayonara, not rod. Gross. It, it, it's really gross to look at. I, I can't say that I love this part of the movie. While the chaos is ensuing, Trantor calls upon evil spirits which help him to ascend to his final form, which basically just means that he's stronger now and his ear nipples grow out a little bit. He arises from beneath the tree and chases Bullcut, who tries to put a stop to him using milk, only to be met with this absolutely terrifying response. I've grown too strong for that. Not even milk can stop me now. <laughs> Bone chilling. Anyway, he kills Bullcut and then jumps down to meet Ernest for their final showdown. And knowing that he can't fight the creature with milk anymore, Ernest realizes that he needs to come up with a plan B. And then for reasons that aren't fully explained, besides the fact that the movie's almost over, he also figures out what the poem meant by the heart of a child and realizes that the way to destroy Trantor is with unconditional love, which plays out like this. <laughs>
I am not making this up. That is how the movie ends. It is perfect. And like I would argue that there is a bit of a paradox there because I feel like if you love something unconditionally for the sole purpose of killing it, then that doesn't really count as unconditional love anymore. That said though, I won't delve too deep into it because this is after all Ernest Scared Stupid and I've already spent too much of my brain space thinking about it. So I feel like we should probably just move on. But yeah, the troll is killed, all the dead kids come back to life, Ernest is reunited with his dog, fade to black on the greatest movie ever made. No, it's perfect, fuck you. Obviously. Uh, yeah, I realized that I love this movie even more than I realized. I don't know why I said it like that. I'm not joking. Watching this movie for the purpose of making this video made me appreciate all the parts of it that I love all that much more. Like after looking at it with a microscope, I feel pretty confident in saying that all the funny parts are genuinely funny and all of the scary parts are genuinely scary and all of the good parts are genuinely good. There are moments here that still genuinely freak me out, and there are parts that still make me laugh without fail that I couldn't show you, you know? Like like this part where Eartha Kit fights a troll. <laughs> that was simple but effective, and I love it very much. And as much as I would love to end the video right there, I don't think that I can because as much as it pains me to say, I, I learned something else watching this movie this time around and th that's that the case could be made that, well, it's kinda, sorta, not very good. I feel dirty saying that. I do still think that the good parts are genuinely good, but when I rewatched this movie this year, it became painfully clear to me that the bad parts are genuinely bad to the point where they may outweigh the good parts. The fact that I watched this movie with a room full of people who aren't me allowed me to see it in a different light because, well, well introducing friends to a movie you love is kind of like introducing friends of yours who haven't met before, which is to say that it's extremely stressful. I don't know if this is relatable because obviously I'm a neurotic mess, but there's something about merging two different friend groups that stresses me out more than high school and nuclear war combined. I, I get so nervous that one friend will not like the other that I enter into a state of hyper awareness where I feel like I'm inspecting every single word that everyone says under an electron microscope for any trace of any reason why these two people that I love are about to hate each other. What should be nice conversations become tense chess games that transform me into a ball of anxiety as I judge every corny joke being made and every awkward lull in conversation while all the while repeating in my head like, like, dear God, please nobody say anything racist. Watching this movie this time around, I entered into a similar state and it kind of let me see the movie through their eyes a little bit and let me tell you, through their eyes, this movie is truly awful. There are a lot of parts in this movie that are bordering on unwatchable that I just kind of let pass when I watch it because I know that the parts I love are on their way, but watching those parts with a room full of people and feeling that room come to a grinding halt, they're a lot harder to ignore. Also, not for nothing, but while my human friends aren't likely to say something racist, this movie super did because I completely glossed over the part where Ernest pretends to be an ottoman and does brown face. We're the ottoman and you're not. Yeah, I totally forgot that that part was in there and I super wasn't proud of myself for showing it to a room full of people, some of whom were strangers. Watching this movie this time around, two things became clear. One, I am a terrible party guest and Two, if I was like the other people in that room seeing this movie for the first time as an adult, I probably wouldn't like it all that much either. Although, 
That said, I didn't see it as an adult. I saw it as a kid, so it remains my favorite movie, and I feel pretty confident in saying that at this point in my life, there's probably never going to be anything that replaces it, because I don't think that there's ever going to be anything that I'm able to love quite as much as I love this movie. Like this movie says, having the heart of a child means unconditional love. It means embracing things with open arms and looking past all the ugliness and warts to give the things you love a big kiss on their slimy, ugly face. Oh, you're so cute. I feel like watching movies was different as a kid. It, it took me a while to even realize that movies could be bad because I was always just excited to be watching anything at all. I assumed that all movies were good movies because I didn't have enough reference to know otherwise. So there's a lot of things I was able to look past back then that I definitely could not look past now. Now that I have the heart of an adult with bad cholesterol, I'm much more aware of how bad things can be, and knowing about all the bad stuff makes it that much easier to spot it. I've heard enough awful jokes and seen enough people be terrible in front of the camera that I'm not as able to ignore that stuff like I used to. And it's not just bad filmmaking that I can't ignore anymore, it's bad everything. Like, like I know I talked a lot about the troll in the bed scene, but honestly watching this movie as an adult, the most upsetting part of it was this. That was close. Yeah, my dad said we could get in big trouble riding in here. It's hard nowadays to watch two kids get into the truck of an adult that their parents told them not to talk to and not think about, well, well, the implications of what that would mean in the real world. I assume you know what I'm talking about. Which is not to say that I think that Ernest is a sexual predator. Uh, I, I super didn't think that I would have to say that, when I set out to make this video, but here we are, so I will reiterate that I don't. But that said, it's really hard as an adult to watch a movie where a large part of the plot involves a random adult taking three children out into the woods to build a secret fort and not feel a little bit icky about it on some level. It kind of makes me think about when I was a kid and I was very aware of the fact that I did not want to be kidnapped, but in my head it was just because that I was like such a cool dude that everyone wanted to snap me up so that I could be their son. It, it wasn't until I grew up a little bit that I looked back on that and thought like, oh, th there's more to that, isn't there? The older you get, the more aware you are that there's a lot of truly terrifying things going on in the world, and that really sucks. And Weirdly, I think that's why so many of us are obsessed with scary things nowadays. Like I said, I didn't really get super into horror and monsters until I was in high school, and that's probably because that's around the same time that those things stopped being the scariest things I could think of. I had seen just enough 9-11s and anthrax scares at that point in my life to realize that the scary guy on the cover of the Hellraiser DVD at my local blockbuster probably wasn't going to be the worst of my problems. Ernest Scared Stupid may have taught me to be aware of everything that might be coming for me from every angle, but once I had that awareness, it wasn't long before I realized that the stuff that might be coming for me in the real world could be way worse than any troll. In the face of actual fears, the ghosts and goblins that I used to find scary as a kid started to seem fun by comparison, and so instead of hiding for them, I started to seek them out because there is honestly something kind of nice about sitting in a dark room for an hour and a half and feeling like the worst thing I had to worry about was a guy in a mask with a knife or a little blue girl climbing out of my television and killing me. Fear is a visceral thing, you know, when you're afraid you really feel it, so scaring yourself like you did when you were a kid can really make you feel like you're a kid again, back before you realized that all your fears were so scary. and. That honestly feels pretty good. At the end of the day, being scared stupid is way more fun than being scared with the full knowledge of all the soul-crushing realities of the world. 
So no, this movie is probably not very good, but I will always love it because when I watch it, it makes me feel like I did when I was younger, before I realized that movies could be bad and the worst thing I could think of was a troll in my bed. Watching this movie makes me feel like I did back when I had the heart of a child and the heart of a child is a very powerful thing. It can fight trolls and it can fight off the horrible feelings you get from all the terrible shit in the world even if it's just for the span of a crummy kids movie from the 90s. So happy Halloween everybody, and if you like Halloween stuff then I suggest that you go check out my other series on this channel from a few years ago called The Spooky Show, because it's all about Halloween stuff, and the audio is a little better because I had someone else doing it for me back then. Uh, also please like and subscribe and, and, and comment and turn on notifications. I don't know, whatever, you, whatever, whatever you've heard other YouTubers tell you to do, do that for me too. I'm not very, I'm not very good at this. In any case, goodbye. Happy Halloween, nitwits. You guys don't have to stay. This part is kind of just for me, but I feel like I should put more thought into the pose that I do for my thumbnail. So I'm going to do that now so that I have it. So um, I feel like since I'm going to be selling a scary movie, I should be scared in it. So I should do something like, like, ah, 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 ah. Hopefully one of those is usable.